as people, we are constantly perceiving things. Like how we seem to spend more time waiting at the squad rack at the gym on Mondays despite zero problems getting glute work in the rest of the week. But perceptions can lead us astray. Like when everyone at the gym thinks I'm scrawny and weak, when really, I can deadlift 500 times more than what most gym bros can. If we don't carefully inspect our hunches, we can wind up believing in differences that aren't really there. I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, Real World Statistics. Speculating that the line for the squat rack is longer on Mondays is a hypothesis, and it's really just the beginning of an investigation. But in statistics, we often get closer to the truth by considering the things that we don't have a hunch about. We do that by using hypothesis testing and imagining a world where the outcome we're interested in is different from what we expect. Then we try and see which version of the world the data fit into better. The one where the squat line is the same length every day, or the one where I've been sitting on the leg press for 45 minutes and there's still two Gymshark clad in influencers in front of me. It's harder to prove something is the same versus that something is different. Like maybe after waiting a full 20 minutes on Monday, I go back Tuesday through Friday and find that the line only takes five minutes. Seems pretty clear, Mondays have the longest wait. But before I never squat again on Mondays, Let's pause. It's possible another nearby gym briefly shuts down on Mondays and leg day enthusiasts decide to crash my gym instead, or that the local soccer team has a one-off training initiation at my gym, rendering it completely unusable. Hmm. In order to take a step towards understanding what's really going on, we have to start with nothing. Or to be precise, the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is sort of the opposite of our hypothesis, represented by this symbol. It's a statement that whatever we think we're onto is not the case. And by assuming that our intuition is actually not on the money, the null hypothesis gives us a model of the world to compare our data to that holds off on jumping to conclusions. At the same time, our initial hypothesis gets called the alternative hypothesis with this symbol. That's the hypothesis that there is something worthy of examining going on, and it's in contradiction to the null hypothesis. Think of that nightmare gym line again. Our null hypothesis would be that the length of the line on Mondays is not any different than the length of the line on other days. The alternative hypothesis is that on Mondays, the line is longer. Now I could swing by the gym over a couple of weeks and count how many people are in line on different days, and it might turn out that our data are compatible with the null hypothesis. In other words, the data could fit a model of the world in which the line is about the same length on all days of the week. In that case, we might start to think our alternative hypothesis is just a gym rage fantasy caused by losing access to my beloved squat rack. And that is the magic of testing the null hypothesis. If we can't knock it down with a statistical test, we might question whether our alternative hypothesis really holds true. This whole process is hypothesis testing, but to actually use this kind of testing in practice, we need some details on what makes for a good hypothesis and how exactly we test it with data. Now, I am so stressed out by this squat rack situation that I'm seeking out meditation classes to help with my uncontrollable rage at gym bros. But my meditation instructor, Jonas, is facing his own stressors. He's noticed that students keep looking at the clock during sessions and getting restless, and he suspects that playing calming music might help. To frame this as a good statistical hypothesis, Jonas needs to come up with a description of his hunch that is specific, measurable, and can be tested with data. So he comes up with an alternative hypothesis. Classes that have relaxing music playing will avoid looking at the clock for a longer period of time than those without the music. And to be even more specific and measurable, he defines the period of time as however long it takes for five or more of his students to glance at the clock. Jonas's alternative hypothesis is what's called a one-tailed test, because it only looks at one tail of the distribution of possible outcomes. He's testing whether one thing is greater or less than a particular reference point. In Jonas's case, his alternative hypothesis is that the period period of time before five students look at the clock is longer with music than without music. His null hypothesis is that playing relaxing music does not lead to a longer time before five students look at the clock than classes without the music. If we picture what the distributions predicted by his alternative hypothesis and null hypothesis would look like, they differ specifically in one direction of his data. But if Jonas's hypothesis had just been the music will lead to a measurably different amount of time spent looking at the clock without worrying about 
whether it was more or less without the music, we'd call it a two-tailed test. In other words, his alternative hypothesis is different from his null hypothesis in both directions, because the average time could be more or less than the time without the music. Now, the alternative hypothesis captures the thing Jonas suspects is happening, that playing calming music will keep students focused. But it's not the thing he tests directly. That's where the null hypothesis comes in, which assumes that the music will not change anything. To collect data, Jonas tosses a coin before his classes, which tend to have similar types of students, to randomly decide whether to play the music or not. For each one, he times how long it takes before five students begin glancing at the clock. By jotting down these clock glancing times, and whether the class did or didn't have the music playing, he's got the data he needs to test his hypothesis. Now, personally, I think he could just get rid of the clock entirely to solve this problem, but the writers have told me that that's not helpful, and it ruins the example. Now, a statistical test can determine how compatible Jonas's data points are with the null hypothesis, and we need to knock down the null hypothesis before we can proceed with our alternative hypothesis. The exact type of test we perform depends on our data, but no matter the test, they ultimately produce an output called a p-value. The p-value is the probability that our data look this way, assuming that our null hypothesis is true. In other words, if the data are consistent with the null hypothesis, we should expect a large p-value. That means it's pretty likely that we'd find our data like this in a null hypothesis world, or in Jonas's case, that the sweet, sweet sounds of Zen music aren't doing much for his restless students like me. But if the data across our samples don't agree with the predictions of our null hypothesis, we'll see a small p-value. That means that this sample is really unlikely to have happened if the null hypothesis is true, so we should be skeptical of the null hypothesis. Basically, things are looking up for Jonas's tunes. To help make the decision about our null hypothesis, we use what's called a significance level. This is a threshold we decide in advance for how small the p-value has to be in order for us to reject the null hypothesis. A smaller significance level means that the data have to look really different from the null hypothesis's predictions in order for us to reject that hypothesis, or decide it's really probably not true. Setting a threshold makes sure we're not too quick to reject the null hypothesis, just because the data happen to look a little off. In practice, significance levels are set to about 5 or 1% because it creates a fairly rigid test, without creating a need to collect a lot of data before we can consider the alternative hypothesis, the thing we're potentially trying to discover. But if we want to be super sure of a groundbreaking discovery that would upturn the world as we know it, or use our findings in a high-stakes situation like rolling out a new drug, we might opt for a much lower significance threshold and trade off some discovery finding potential for certainty. We'll talk about some of the problems with that in a moment, but for now though, it's a perfectly well-defined way to test what the null hypothesis is predicting. Going back to our meditation struggles, let's say Jonas opts for a 5% significance level, and after calculating his statistical test, he gets a p-value of 3%. That's less than his significance level, so in this case, he rejects the null hypothesis, which said that the music had no effect, because the data are more consistent with the alternative hypothesis. In this situation, that would mean we would have enough evidence to say that the music has an effect. But let's suppose Jonas instead opted for a 1% significance level, and with the same data, he still ended up with a p-value of 3% after calculating his statistical test. That p-value of 3% is greater than his significance level, so in this case, he does not reject the null hypothesis, which is consistent with the music having no effect. That must mean he accepts his null hypothesis, right? WRONG! He simply fails to reject it. When the data are more consistent with the null hypothesis, we say that we do not have enough evidence to conclude that the alternative hypothesis is true. Jonas doesn't have enough evidence to say that the music has an effect. This is where we run into the pitfall of hypothesis testing. It can't tell you what is definitely true, only what the data do or don't give evidence for. That's because setting a significance threshold and calculating a p-value from a statistical test isn't airtight. For starters, something like a significance level of 5% which is used in a lot of statistical analyses, still leaves room for a 1 in 20 chance that even if the null hypothesis is true, your data points might happen to look like they disagree because of random chance. And setting the significance threshold
threshold for rejecting or not rejecting the null hypothesis at a single point can feel a little arbitrary. After all, a p-value of 4.9% basically indicates the same agreement between a hypothesis and the data as a p-value of 5.1%, even though one falls below 5 and the other above it. It also feels weird to call one value significant compared to another. On one hand, if we don't set some kind of threshold, it's hard to tell if we have evidence for our alternative hypothesis or not. And here we use a significance threshold that is a clearly defined way of conducting an investigation. But some researchers think that getting rid of significance thresholds and dealing with that kind of uncertainty head on is perfectly fine. No matter what, deciding if we believe our alternative hypothesis should come from other kinds of statistical investigations. Now, we've been talking about p-values in ways that they're useful, but let's quickly talk about what a p-value is not. A p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. A p-value is the probability of getting data like this or more extreme if we've already assumed the null hypothesis is true. Jonas's p-value of 3% tells him that there's a 3% chance that even if his null hypothesis is true, his data would look the way they do. Hypothesis testing can't tell us for sure whether our hypotheses are true. It can only check how plausible the data we have are under different assumptions. It helps us check our initial intuitions and figure out if what we're observing really is weird, or maybe we're just in the grip of Zen meditation or roid rage, because I take steroids, apparently. Thanks, writers. Finding a p-value is part of that process, but the p-value by itself can't tell you the whole story. You've got to use statistical tests, your knowledge of the data, and some good old common sense to get as close to the truth as you possibly can. There are a lot of pitfalls to using p-values, but hypothesis testing is an invaluable way of skeptically investigating new conclusions and gathering evidence. By understanding what a p-value is telling you and how your statistical test does or does not support your hypotheses, you're getting right to the heart of what makes statistics so important and that's knowing how to interpret data in light of your assumptions and being clear on what is or isn't uncertain. And once you accept that hypotheses are something that you can't truly accept 100%, but only edge closer towards with your beliefs and data, you'll finally find inner peace. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall real world statistics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out ghoststudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment a hypothesis you'd like to test, and smash that subscribe button like you also have roid rage. Thanks for watching and see you next time.